Hello. Thanks for coming out, everybody, uh, to see our presentation. Uh, Dan, we're on the journey, navigating the environment and beyond. Um, I'm Brian Simmons, my coworker and supervisor back here at Warren, running the computer right now. Um, if at any point you're having problems hearing me or anything, just let me know. Just try to speak up. Um, hopefully, through this presentation, you'll gain a deeper understanding of Sam and Steelhead from the Amaha River and uh, what we do as a project, the Experts Tribe Department of Fisheries Resource Management. Um, first of all, uh, I'd like to acknowledge our field crews, both those who uh, presently work for us and those in the past, um, especially our crew leaders, uh, Joseph McCormick, David Bright, uh, they've been working on the project for uh, nearly four decades of combined experience. Um, they're a staple in the water in Naha. Without their efforts down there, we wouldn't be able to collect the data that we do and uh, successfully monitor these populations. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge our co-managers, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, our funding agencies, the Bonneville Power Administration and Lower Snake River Compensation Plan, and um, our collaborators, the Fish Passive Center. Um, so, first of all, uh, I want to talk about the ecological importance of these species. Um, Pacific salmon and steelhead trout are incredibly ecologically important um, throughout their range. They are what is considered a keystone species, meaning that they are a species within an ecosystem that other species largely depend on. Uh, so much so that if they were removed from the ecosystem, it would change drastically. Um, throughout their life cycle, salmon are believed to contribute to the diet of at least 137 other vertebrates. I mean, that's just, you know, bears, birds, <coughs> deer, other, other animals with spines. Um, so when these fish are out in the uh, productive North Pacific Ocean, uh, they feed and they grow the rate that they wouldn't be able to in fresh water. Um, and their bodies accumulate nutrients. And when they return to the freshwater systems they were born in, um, those nutrients are spread throughout the ecosystem. Um, they're prey for bears, eagles, a host of other predators. Uh, their flesh feeds scavengers, insects, microinvertebrates. Uh, the nitrogen, uh, which is you know major super fertilizer that they accumulated in the ocean, is spread across the landscape by other animals. It fertilizes the soil and helps plants and trees grow, which in turn provide food and habitat for other animals. <coughs> so, as I've said, they're incredibly ecologically important to the region. Um, the Omaha River is home to endemic species of, or endemic stocks of spring, summer, Chinook salmon, and some are steelhead. Um, you can see examples of a juvenile schnook up there, juvenile steelhead down there, both wild, both kinds of on hot traps. Um, unfortunately, the abundance of these populations has decreased drastically in recent history. Um, due largely to anthropogenic impacts, um, you know, such as habitat loss, uh, dams are a big contributor there overfishing, and climate change. Um, due to this, uh, these populations were listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. And what that means is that they are likely to become endangered within the foreseeable future um, with current conditions at their current population levels. And being endangered means that they're in serious danger of becoming extinct throughout all, or at least a significant portion of their um, and you might think it doesn't really make sense that they're endangered to going extinct throughout their whole range because salmon and steelhead um, span across the North Pacific. Um, you know, they're really healthy populations, relatively healthy populations um, up in Alaska and across the Pacific Ocean. Um, the thing is, though, salmon and steelhead have a propensity to return to the same stream or body of water. Um, where they are born to reproduce. Um, due to this helming behavior, um, over generations, 
they become essentially geographically and reproductively isolated from other stocks of the same species. Um, as this occurs, they develop more and more specialized and localized traits that make them really good at surviving um, in their local area where they came from. Um, based upon this reproductive isolation and the fact that Snake River, Chinook and Steelhead were deemed to represent an important component of the evolutionary legacy of the species, um, they were able to be listed um, on the ESA as an evolutionarily significant unit, um, which allows them to be treated as a unique species because they are very unique to the region that they come from. Um, furthermore, these stocks were identified as major population groups, which is just a finer scale definition saying that they have uh, genetic and spatial characteristics that make them unique to the Anaha and Grand Ronde basins within that greater Snake River stock. So really what that all boils down to is our Anaha River fish have evolved for a long time and become specialized at surviving in the Anaha River. Um, I'd like to take a second to touch on some abundance levels uh, that we list in our in the Nez Perce Tribe Fisheries uh, 2013 to 2028 Management Plan. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about those in here. We have a copy up here. Jim Harbeck brought over if anybody wants to take a look at this after the presentation. Um, the first numbers up there are the minimum viable ones. These numbers are the minimum number of returning adults that we think are necessary for the species to maintain genetic integrity and to avoid risk of extinction. Um, for the Yamaha stocks, as you see there, we believe that we need a thousand natural Chinook and a thousand natural steelhead to change. Um, the next numbers, sustainable escapement, you can see are quite a bit larger, 5,700 for Chinook. 4,300 for natural steelhead. Um, those are the numbers of which we believe, uh, you know, there would be a substantial amount of spawning. It wouldn't be maximized, but most of the spawning habitat in the river would be utilized. And these number of returning fish would provide fisheries both for tribal and non-tribal fisheries. And then finally are the ecological escapement numbers, which are much, much larger. 38,000 Chinook, 21,000 steelhead. Um, these are closer to what we believe historic levels to be within the basin, and these are the levels at which we believe um, spawning abundance would be maximized. So all the gravel that fish can spawn in, everywhere they can rear, it's being utilized by those fish. And it's also the level at which we think we would see those ecosystem level processes taking place, where the nutrients are being distributed throughout the entire ecosystem within the basin, and it's all becoming more productive. Now, I'd like to take a second to look at our actual return numbers in the Amaha River Basin. Um, these are estimates of natural origin, age four or five, Chinook salmon, um, calculated by ODFW staff based on spawning ground survey data. Um, these are only fish that are believed to be spawning in the Amaha River. I think it's important to acknowledge that. Uh, these numbers don't represent jacks, or fish that were removed by harvest, or fish that were removed by predation. Only those that we estimate spawned in the Amaha River. Um, as you can see, it varies quite a bit annually. Um, the peak in 2013, since they started keeping track in 1985, I believe was uh, just over 1,300 genetic. But as you can see, um, the viable abundance level is shown by that red line. And most years, the adult number of spawners coming back is significantly below that level. Uh, in the most recent estimate, 2017, it was only believed that 205 should have spawned in the Nile River, uh, with only below the Nile River. Uh, these are similar estimates, except for adult steelhead returning to the Nile River. Um, these are calculated by Nets Perch Fisheries staff based upon pit tag data um, detections throughout the basin. You can see, again, that they're 
fluctuating um, annually. They seem to be doing quite a bit better than Chinook based on that viable abundance level. But uh, over time, you can see that there's definitely a negative trend. And in 2017, um, it was estimated that only 839 adult steelhead returned to the Mohammed River Basin and its tributaries. Um, in addition to being um, incredibly ecologically important to the region, um, Pacific salmon and steelhead, along with other native fish species to the Wawa Valley and Northeast Oregon, were and are of high cultural importance to the Nez Perce people. Um, Nez Perce culture revolved around fish and water. Uh, many months in the Nez Perce calendar are named after fish species and fishing times. Um, I'm going to paraphrase this, but in a Nez Perce story, a meeting between creator and animals, the creator called all of the animals together to tell them of a great change, which many of them would not survive. In order to survive, the animals had to qualify themselves to be useful to human beings. As human beings would come to the world naked, would have a hard time making them. One by one, different animal species came forward. Um, salmon and steelhead came forward and they said they could help human beings with their flesh. And because of that, they were qualified by the Creator and allowed to survive. Um, knowing that salmon and steelhead have such high importance for the Nez Perce people, over time, researchers have tried to determine how many fish were historically harvested and used by the Nez Perce. <coughs> Um, some of this research suggests that up to 50% of the Nez Perce diet was made up of fish, um, and that each tribal member consumed anywhere from 300 to 564 pounds of fish per year. So it's just an incredibly valuable, necess necessary resource to the Nez Perce people. The Nez Perce way of life and survival greatly depended upon their ability to fish, hunt, gather, and pasture animals as they always had. Um, with this in mind, they expressly reserved these rights in the Treaty of 1855, um, including rights for fishing, um, you know, the exclusive right of taking fish in all streams, running through or bordering said reservation and the right of taking fish at all the usual and custom places. Um, the Nez Perce never would have signed the treaty um, without receiving assurances that these rights would be protected in the future. Um, additional treaties have been made between the Nez Perce and the United States government, but the treaty right for hunting, fishing, gathering has remained unchanged since the Treaty of 1855. So, as an agency, Nez Perce fisheries, our guiding philosophy is largely based on the cultural values of the Nez Perce. Um, that the earth and its natural resources were a gift from the Creator. Um, we're not, we didn't inherit them from our ancestors, we're only borrowing them from our children's children. And therefore, we have an obligation to protect those gifts and use them wisely. So that's why we're working to restore fish in this region. Um, for the scope of this presentation, I think it's important to get a grasp of the land's traditional use and important to the Nez Perce people. Um, and Dark Tan, the largest area that you'll see up here, is the uh, Columbia River Basin, including the State River Basin. Um, much of which was inside, uh, or was within, the traditional Nez Perce area of influence. Um, this is areas where they were known to have traveled, inhabited, hunted, fished, and traded with other indigenous peoples. Um, the second area, in light green, is an area that was determined by the Indian Claims Commission um, to the Nez Perce had exclusive use and occupancy and aboriginal ownership over against any other tribes based upon anthropological evidence. Um, this area very closely resembles um, the reservation that was negotiated by the Nez Perce during the 1855 treaty. Um, and then finally, that smaller dark green polygon 
um, is the current reservation boundary that was uh, essentially forced upon the Esbergs and the Steel Treaty of 1863. So, despite the Willow Bands forced out of their homeland, uh, the Willow Valley, the Omaha River, and the Grand Ronde River system, and the fisheries that those systems produces, produce have remained very valuable to the Nespers people. Um, our project is on the Omaha River, which you can see highlighted in dark blue. Um, the red dot is our traffic site near the mouth, and we monitor the fish that we study um, from that point all the way out through the state of Columbia. Um, so this is a scaled up version or map of the Indaha River watershed. Um, the Indaha River small monitoring trap is located right there, um, indicated by the red dot. It's approximately seven river kilometers from the mouth of the Omaha River. Um, the only tributary below it is Cow Creek. Um, this is fairly unique within small traps and juvenile migrant traps in the region. This location allows us to get a really solid understanding of the juveniles leaving the Omaha River. Um, you can also see on this map uh, the Little Sheep Weir and Activation Facility. This is where um, returning hatchery steelhead are collected and hatchery steelhead smolts are released. And you can also see the government weir activation facility. Um, that's where the same operations are performed for hatchery spring and summer shedding. Um, so in order to have a little bit better understanding of our project, um, I think it's important to have an understanding of salmon steelhead life cycle. Um, Chinook salmon steelhead are both anadromous fish, which means that they are born in freshwater, and they reproduce in freshwater, and they migrate to the ocean and come back. Um, starting with egg deposition, a um, female will dig a pit in the river substrate, in the gravel, and lay eggs. Um, simultaneously fertilized by a male and then covered up to create a red or a fishnet in the or fish nest, not fish net, sorry, in the gravel. Um, the eggs incubate and develop and eventually albins hatch out. Now these are um, juvenile salmon pretty early in development. They don't have fully developed fins yet. They still have a yolk sac um, which provides them nutrients. And they're still hanging out down in the gravel as they develop and absorb that yolk sac up until the point where they have developed fins. Um, once they absorb that yolk sac and fully develop fins, they will emerge from the gravel as fry and develop in the par as they rear in their native streams. Um, Chinook will typically rear in their native stream only for about a year. Um, steelhead. Um, or juvenile sea around the rainbow trout will typically rear from one to four years um, and head out any time during that period. Um, eventually, a combination of genetic and environmental factors uh, trigger a physiological change known as smolification, where they become streamlined, more silvery in color, and the juveniles begin their migration to the ocean. Um, this usually coincides with high spring flows, and those high flows help them on their migration out to the ocean. Um, once the smolts reach the mouth of the Columbia River, they'll rear there for a while longer and they'll adapt to salt water before they head out into the ocean uh, to feed and grow. Typically, out in the Pacific, the Mount Harbor River Chinook will spend one to three years feeding and growing, um, steelhead will spend one to two years before they return to the river um, at the mouth of the Columbia, swim all the way back up to the Amalha River, essentially to where they were born, pair up and spawn. Um, after spawning, salmon, Chinook salmon, dive immediately, or essentially immediately. Um, their nutrients stay there in the stream and are spread across the landscape and help provide food and nutrients for the system and for their young. 
Um, steelhead are a little bit different. They can spawn multiple times, though it's not very common out in this region. So after spawning, they'll uh, start to claw out of the tributaries as kelts and try to return to the ocean, where they will feed and grow and try to return to spawn. Um, so essentially, the hatchery origin life cycle is the same, but it's modified um, in a couple of key places that I thought it was important to touch on. So adult um, steelhead and chinook, instead of returning to the area of the tributary or the area of the Amnaha where they were born, where they were in the gravel, they'll return to the acclimation facility where they were released as smolts. Um, there they're collected either in a, in a weir or a dole trap and um, spawn, the eggs are fertilized, they're transported to a hatchery facility where the eggs are incubated. Once hatched, they, um, they're raised in ponds uh, for about a year, transported back <coughs> to the Amnaha, and then released the smolts to migrate out to the ocean. Um, so here's some photographs of our small trap, brewery screw trap, and our tagging site. It's heading down there on the lower Amnaha near Cow Creek. Um, so in order to get a better understanding of these populations uh, using metrics like abundance estimates, survival, and small to adult returns, um, we need to capture the juveniles on the way out of the river when they're migrating. So in order to do that, we use a rotary screw trap, which is essentially an Archimedes screw or an auger, um, which you can see here, within a cone of perforated metal. And uh, that's floated in between pontoons. And when that cone is lowered into the river, the force of the current causes it to turn. Um, and as juvenile fish migrate out of the river, they flow with the current through the cone and back into a live box where they're captured. And we can then collect them and process them. Um, so after the fish are captured, um, Project staff can go down to the trap and use a dip net to scoop fish out and put them in five gallon buckets. Uh, you can see one of our crew leads, Dave Wright, doing that right there. Um, they're then transported up to our tagging tent, um, taken inside, kept on air with aerators to keep the water oxygenated and uh, processed. So, Individual target fish, uh, being juvenile, salmon, steelhead, are enumerated, uh, weighed, scanned for pit tags, and if they don't have one, injected with a pit tag, and then released back in the river. And uh, to give you guys a better example of what a pit tag is, I have these guys here. You can pass around. It is a 12 millimeter long, at least one to be used, a 12 millimeter long. Um, essentially a small microchip that has a unique ID programmed into it. Um, and once a fish is tagged with a pit tag, um, that fish will be automatically detected when passed by an interrogation antenna. Um, so interrogation and collection sites with pit tag technology are spread all throughout um, the Columbian Snake River, river basins, which allow us to trap these fish from the time they're tagged and released uh, to wherever they travel throughout the basin and determine the fate. Um, and I believe that was all I had. I think this is a good time if uh, anybody has any questions for me before I pass this off to Laura. She gets into the really interesting stuff. Yes. I'm sorry I was a little late and you covered this, but I, mean, I saw your graphs. What percent of the fish are um, native versus uh, hatchery fish now? Uh, uh, the, in those graphs, those were only representing natural fish. Um, um, I honestly couldn't tell you offhand. I'd have to look at the exact numbers. Um, I don't believe that. What would um, you guess? More hatchery or more native? Typically more hatchery fish. Um, they're, they're far, they're, Typically, a larger number of hatchery fish released as smolts in the system than we estimate native fish are rearing in the system. And uh, I believe also 
typically are like higher returns more. And what is your um, what's the rationale that there's the declining numbers? Is that um, do we, is it main manufacturers or is there? It's, it's, it's pretty complicated. Yeah. It all, I'll touch base yeah. on that a little bit. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so that's that's not entirely in my realm. Um, there are different protocols. Um, some protocols require those carcasses to be landfilled because agencies are concerned about um, the spread of disease, fish health, um, while other agencies um, will all plant carcasses to try to improve nutrients. Um, uh, Ron, I, I didn't fully hear the question, but if, if if the question was, what do we do with carcasses after they've been spawned? Yes. Uh, the Nesper's tribe does all plant hatchery steelhead and Little Sheep Creek to provide uh, nutrients to that system. Um, prior to our um, efforts, those fish were landfilled, and we felt that they had better use, and that use is to improve the environment. So we do all plant hatchery carcasses that have been small. Yeah. Is there any mortality associated with pit tagging? Um, yes, there is, but it's essentially negligible. Um, so long as tagging practices um, follow predetermined protocols and are done well, uh, mortality is very, very minimal. So you think the, the return you get from the data is, is worth the mortality that you thought? Yes. At what time during the life cycle is it uh, fishing season? That is, when, can, can they be caught before they uh, before they spawn, or can they be caught only after? Um, it's it's typically before they spawn, and most fisheries will limit where you can fish so that you're not targeting the fish on spawning grounds. So uh, you're typically targeting them lower in the rivers on the way spawn. Do uh, hatchery fish ever come up and then spawn and then the spawn uh, fish that they put out of become native fish? Um, so I can't speak specifically to the rate of that in these systems. Um, there are management decisions that um, essentially what we do out here is we have supplementation programs where Initially, these hatchery programs were starting from native brood stock, so they're starting from wild fish. Um, and being passed above these weirs um, at collection, they will pass as many wild fish as they possibly can, and typically a certain number of supplementation fish as well, I believe, um, in order to try to maximize spawning. Um, to get at what I think you're really asking is, there definitely are possibilities all throughout their range that hatchery fish could stray and spawn with wild fish and produce progeny that would then not have an adipose fin clip and would not be distinguishable um, other than through genetic analysis from wild fish. Yes? You mentioned that when the smolts go down the river towards the sea that they start to change and they get silver and more streamlined. Yeah. What else happens to them biologically so they can adapt to salt water? Um, so uh, they undergo quite a few physiological changes to to deal with salt water specifically. I think uh, the quickest answer to your question is they have chloride cells in their gills that allow them to better manage um, salt water content within their body. Um, so if those aren't functioning normally, um, a fish that is used to salt water or fresh water, if it's put in the opposite, it can't manage its hydration basically, so it won't survive. So while they're rearing the estuary, um, I can't remember which one it is, but there are what are called alpha chloride and beta chloride cells. And those undergo a switch where the ones uh, fade away and are replaced so that they're able to lift the salt water. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Okay. And beyond down through the whole hydro system. And so 
right? I think you want to get like a space bar. Right. So smolts migrate out in the Yamaha River down through the, the Snake River. There's four lower Snake River dams that the smolts have to migrate through. And then they hit the Columbia here at the confluence, and then they have to migrate through four additional Columbia River dams before they make it out to the estuary. They stay out there for one to three years, like Brian said, and then they return as adults. Back to the <laughs> And so the adults, they also have to navigate the same hydro system, but they do it a little bit differently than what the, the smolts do. So we'll touch base on that a little bit. Um, and not all the dams are the same, but a lot of the dams have kind of this kind of passive, fish passage um, associated with them. So first, for smolts migrating out, there's kind of three ways they can get down through the dams. One way is to go over the spillway. And so they'll just go right over the spillway and keep on with their journey. Another way is they'll kind of get sucked in. Well, not, I shouldn't say necessarily sucked in, but they'll, they'll make their way down to this turbine intake. And if they're lucky, they'll get collected by this juvenile bypass pit. Uh, system, which kind of is a series of channels and tunnels and stuff, and what it'll do is it'll take the fish, the juveniles up, and then send them down through and spit them out below, uh, below the dam, where it's a lot safer um, than going through the turbine system. Or, uh, depending on the dam operations at that time, the fish can be sent to um, kind of this race waste facility where they're held until they uh, are ready to be loaded onto either a truck or a barge. And then the fish collected at a particular dam will then be trucked or barged clear down below Bonneville Dam, which is the last dam in Columbia that these fish would have to navigate. So um, the, that's the first two ways fish can go through, juvenile fish can go through the dam. The last way is fish will go through the turbine. And so they may or not may not make it that way. They might be uh, killed by the turbine. So when the fish come back as adults, there's only one way pretty much to get up over the dam, and that is, which most of you are probably familiar with, is the adult fish ladder. I'm sure probably a lot of you have seen these before. So that's the only way that adults can get up through. Laura, and what's the percentage of the smolts going one way or another there? And how many of them get chewed up in the, in the <laughs> That's, uh, those are details that I don't have handy right now, but there is a larger group of folks that kind of take, so we're just one small monitoring program. There are a lot of these all throughout the Snake and Columbia rivers, and so we all kind of pool our data together, and there's a separate group from us that kind of work on all the data as one, um, uh, as one big cohort, and they kind of estimate those numbers and, and look at that a little bit. But I don't know right off top of hand. There are reports that they put out already with thousand pages, so I haven't made my way through that yet. Uh, so, uh, but as Brian was talking about earlier, those pit tag antennas that detect our fish as they're moving through the system, these dams have pit tag antennas all over them. So they have them at the juvenile bypass facility, they'll even have them at spillways sometimes. Um, and we definitely have them on the adult um, fish ladders. And so the detection at these antennas varies. We're really good at detecting adults because they're in, kind of in this confined space, but juveniles, we're pretty, that we have different detection probabilities depending on the antenna and depending on the facility that we're moving through. But we still detect a lot of juveniles in the past. So just to kind of add some additional um, data to why we're doing all this. And uh, this is just a figure of our historical small to adult return ratio. So generally, uh, back in the day, before all these dams went in up here, back in like before the mid 60s, um, we were getting return rates of adults in the four to six, almost 7% range. So for every 100 smolts that go out, we would get six, seven adults back. Um, but post-dam, uh, we have seen a drastic decline in the number of adults we're getting back. So this is pretty good evidence to say that, yeah, these dams are impacting these populations. So to get into kind of the data that we collect and what we do with it and how it, it um, goes out and helps to manage uh, these fisheries and, and, the, and the dams and everything, I'm going to talk about uh, some basic biology 
Um, so looking at arrival and travel timing of juveniles at the Anaha Trap, uh, abundance estimates of juveniles at the Anaha Trap, and then also size and condition of juveniles as they're migrating out past the Anaha Trap. And then also we're going to then step back and take a little bit bigger look at some population dynamics of Anaha, Chinook, and Steelhead, specifically looking at um, juvenile or immigrant survival as they move down through the Snake and Columbia Rivers, and then also looking at that adult return rate. Okay, so first off, looking at basic biology for arrival and travel timing. Um, as Brian alluded to earlier, Hydrology kind of plays a big role in, in the, my, the immigration of smolts out of the Anaha <coughs> system. And so when we get a big pulse of flow in the spring, we'll see a bunch of fish move out with that uh, big pulse of water. But then also, arrival and travel timing is important for dam management because if the dams know that these fish are coming down the system, they'll oftentimes alter the spill um, because altering the spill and increasing it helps these fish have better survival rates down through the system. Not only to get them over the dam through the spillway, but also if you think about a dam, there's a big reservoir behind it. If they can get that water moving faster down through that reservoir, it helps those fish move faster down through that reservoir, which leads to them being uh, less likely to be preyed upon by like smallmouth bass and other large piscivores that are in that reservoir. Um, but also it just helps kind of push them down through there a little bit faster. So looking at uh, arrival time of Chinook at the Anaha Trap, I'll just walk you guys through this figure. Um, so we kind of have two different pulses of, fit of Chinook that come through the Anaha Trap. And we have the uh, discharge of the Anaha River is represented by the black line here. There's a month on the bottom. So these data are for 2017, but um, they're pretty typical uh, for, for every year. Um, but whenever we talk about immigrating fish, oftentimes our data will go from October through July of the following year. We call that a migration year, because so, that's when these fish are migrating um, down, to the, down to the ocean. And so then on the <coughs> right axis here, we have how many fish we're catching at our trap per hour. So if we look at these data, we see we have a big pulse of Chinook coming down from about November through early January, and we designate these Chinook as pre smolts And then if the trap will kind of go on a dry spell for a little bit, and then we'll get another big pulse of fish coming down through, and um, from about February through June, July, they start to taper off quite a bit. And we call these fish smolts. And so if you look at the, here's a pretty smolt right here. They're a little bit smaller. They have those nicely defined car marks on their sides, like Brian was talking about earlier. But then when we get our spring fish coming down through those car marks, they start to disappear. The fish becomes more silvery. And so it's starting to make that physiological change to ready to go to salt water. Um, and also what I wanted to point out here, the pre-smolts, pre we don't see any, really, real, any real relationship with kind of discharge of the river, so how much water is coming down through the river. But with the smolts, we definitely see there is that relationship there that when the flows bump up in the spring and we start to get that snow melt, we see a lot, of, a lot more Chinook coming out of the system. And we can look at a similar figure for steelhead. And for steelhead, um, we do not see any fish coming down in the fall, really. We'll get a few, but not very many. Um, but really when we start to see the steelhead come out of the Anaha system is uh, a little bit later in the year than the spring fish of uh, Chinook, but from about April uh, into July a little bit. But again, it's closely associated with this big bump in the hydrograph. So that's one way to kind of look at fish moving past uh, the Anaha Trap. Another way to look at it is uh, with these cumulative proportion. So uh, in all my figures, uh, natural Chinook, so the wild fish are going to be in light gray and the hatchery fish are going to be in dark gray. So that's going to be consistent throughout this presentation. But um, so we have cumulative proportion of Chinook 
on the uh, x axis or y axis and date on the x axis. Again, this is for 2017, but it's pretty typical of all years to be a Naha with a little bit of variation. And we can see that uh, in the spring, this is just the, the Chinook smolt, doesn't include the pre smolt. We start seeing these fish kind of trickle in into April, and we get a big bump with those flows, and then it kind of tapers off again for the natural fish. For the hatchery fish, we're going along, and then all of a sudden we get a ton, like thousands of hatchery fish at the trap. We're working, we're working all night to keep up with the number of fish we're catching. Um, and that is because we have this big bump, is that's when up at the acclimation facility that Brian talked about earlier, that's when they pull those gates on those raceways and allow those fish to volitionally release on their own. But Chinook, they tend to like to all come out at once, and so we get a big bump of fish and then it just kind of tapers off. So these fish move past the Amaha trap within a matter of days, whereas our natural fish, you know, we're seeing a long extended migration from them. They take a long time just to kind of, you know, they're slowly releasing from the headwaters and you can pass the trap. So that was what we see at the Anaha trap. Then we can say, because we have those antennas set up everywhere, we can say, okay, well, when do these fish show up at Lower Granite Dam? And so that was the, that's the first dam they encounter below the Anaha trap is down on the Snake River. And so, um, we see that these two curves look much more similar now. And so we're still, the, the uh, natural fish show up at lower granite first, and then the hatchery fish show up, but the curves have similar slope, the, the fish, the hatchery and the natural fish are kind of showing up at a similar rate. And so, oops, they're joking. And like hit the space bar maybe? Oh, shoot. Okay, now, no, that's right, that's right. I'm getting ahead of myself in my head. Okay. So now, now we can kind of merge these two curves together. And then hit it again. All right. Oh, technology. <laughs> Actually, it's not that fancy nowadays. <laughs> but um, so now we can kind of merge all this together. And what we can look at is travel time. So how we do that is we can just say, OK, here's our, our Naha trap fish or the solid lines. Our lower granite fish are the dashed lines. And so we can look at the difference for natural fish between the Naha trap line and the lower grant line and then say, okay, well, you know, that probably takes these fish on average a couple, couple weeks to get down to lower granite. But when we look at hatchery fish, it's like, okay, well, it's a bigger gap right there. You know, it's taken these fish maybe a few weeks, maybe even a month to travel from the Naha trap to lower granite. And that's important because this travel time, the longer those fish are out in the system and in these reservoirs and, and moving down through here, they found that their survival rate is lower. So we want to get these fish down through the system essentially as fast as we can. And so we can look at a similar figure for steelhead. I didn't break it apart this time. I just kind of threw it all up there together. Um, but here it's even more interesting whenever you look at travel time for the natural fish from the trap down to lower granite, it's like a matter of days. So these steelhead, they get in the water, once they start moving, they go. Um, compared to the hatchery fish, there is a big difference there. Again, hatchery fish are taking weeks or even you know, a month to get down through there. And like I said, it's really important for survival. They've, they've done a study where it shows that fish that take longer travel time to get down through the Snake and Columbia Rivers have a much lower survival rate than those that just kind of move on out. All right, so moving on to abundance, and Brian kind of alluded to abundance a little bit earlier, um, but there is a lot of variability in abundance uh, estimates from year to year, and that is um, caused by, one, the number of responding adults, so how many fish are up there actually laying eggs, but then, uh, two, it's also really influenced by the carrying capacity of the system, and what I mean by that is how much habitat and how much food is available for these juveniles to rear in. So if we look at abundance estimates for Inaha River immigrants for our hatchery finite, our hatchery fish, our hatchery Chinook, and our natural Chinook, um, first thing that kind of jumps right off the page is there's a lot of fish in the system, hundreds of thousands of fish in the system. Uh, second thing you kind of notice is the hatchery bars are way higher than what our natural fish bars are. Um, 
So, and that's, you know, that's typical, uh, or has been for, for several years. Um, and then also, uh, the natural um, uh, Chinook abundance estimates, they're broken up into pre-smolts with the black and the uh, spring smolts uh, in the lighter gray. Um, and then also, another thing on this figure to take note is these red diamonds above the hatchery bars, that's the actual number of fish released from the acclimation facility. So for Chinook, it would have been released from the gum, gum boot facility. And so we do see some mortality from the acclimation site down to the Yamaha track. But, um, and another thing, there's just a lot of variability from year to year, how many, even in the hatchery fish, how many fish they release. And, and ODFW and uh, the tribe, we all work together on kind of uh, what numbers, the number of fish we want to release each year and everything. So there's, there's reasons behind that variability in the hatchery release. And a similar figure for steelhead. Um, still we're getting hundreds of thousands of, of fish down in the Naha system. Uh, not quite as many as Chinook. Um, our steelhead, uh, natural steelhead abundance estimates, fairly consistent over the years. So around 50, 75,000 fish. Um, as compared to the hatchery fish that are running around 150, 200,000 fish per year released from the hatchery. Again, the red diamonds are the actual number of smolts released at the acclimation facility. And so again, there is some mortality there from track down to, or from the facility down to track. All right, um, and then uh, we weigh and measure all of our fish that come through, that we catch in the Amnaha trap, or all the salmon, or all the Chinook and steelhead. And um, that way we can look at kind of size differences between the hatchery and the natural fish. And then also we uh, calculate what we call uh, the condition factor. We can also look at differences and condition between hatchery and, and, what, and natural fish. And it's not surprising that size and condition play a big role in survival and mortality of these fish as they move down through the, the uh, same Columbia rivers. And so that condition factor is called Fulton's K, so the Fulton condition factor. And it's an easy equation. You just take the length of the fish times the weight of the fish cubed. And basically what that is, it kind of tells us the shape of the fish. So do we have like a long, skinny, streamlined fish? Or do we have a short, squatty, not as streamlined fish. <laughs> and so you can see here, it's pretty consistent. Here's our natural fish. Here's our hatchery fish for Chinook. Natural steelhead, hatchery steelhead. Typically, our hatchery fish are larger than our natural fish. And we have some data to show that. Um, so this is just this uh, length frequency histogram. And it just kind of shows the distributions of lengths for our natural fish and our hatchery fish. And so you can see there's a big difference, or not a huge difference, but there is a, there's quite a difference between um, the size of the, the natural fish we handle and the size of the hatchery fish we handle. And this is all for Chinook. And then also our, the hatchery Chinook tend to have a higher condition factor than the natural uh, Chinook, meaning the hatchery fish is a little plumper and, and Plumper than the natural fish. And similar figure for steelhead, again, our hatchery fish a bit bigger um, than our natural fish, and uh, not as big of a difference in the condition factor between natural fish and hatchery fish, but there's still a bit of one. All right, so moving on to population dynamics. And so pit tagging is key in getting estimates for integrate survival as these fish move down through the hydro system. And as you can imagine, there are several sources of mortality as these fish move down out to the ocean. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, there is, um, there's been some studies over the past 20 years or so that have really have influenced how the dams are operated and how much spill occurs and when it occurs occurs because they have shown that an increase in spill really helps boost survival rates of these fish. So looking at survival, I'm going to talk about a couple different um, survival estimates here. Uh, one is from the Anaha Trap down to Lower Granite, and that just encompasses this portion of the Snake River that doesn't have any dams on it. 
So we want to we estimate survival then and say, okay, this is kind of what it looks like in this section. And then we want to look at and not survival from the Naha Trap down to McNary Dam. And so that encompasses fish that have to move down these four lower snake dams. So right off the bat, looking at survival from the trap for <coughs> granite, um, something that'll jump out, right, uh, jump out from this figure is that uh, our pre small survival is much lower than our Chinook natural Chinook smolt or our hatchery Chinook smolt survival. And the reason for that is because, remember those pre smolts they migrate out in the fall? Well, they're overwintering down here in the Snake River. And so this survival estimate incorporates that overwinter survival in the lower Snake River. So there's just much lower survival down there. Uh, the other thing that you'll notice is all of these lines look like they're slightly declining, which is not necessarily what we want to see. We want to see survival increasing over the years. So this is from 1994 to 2017. So it's like, okay, there, you know, there is there is this negative trend there. And so we don't like to see that too much. But when we look at steelhead um, from the Naha Trap down to Lower Granite from 1995 to 2017, we see that um, hatchery steelhead survival, on average, is increasing, um, and our natural steelhead survival is staying, maybe slightly increasing, staying about the same, so, so that's pretty good. However, um, this is kind of reassuring. Uh, we see when we look at survival from the trap down to the canary, so that, those, that survival estimate is from those fish that have had to pass through um, these lower uh, snake river dams, we see that that negative trend goes away. So these fish are just, uh, their survival has kind of stabilized over time, and so it's pretty consistent from year to year. And then looking at steelhead, uh, hatchery steelhead, they're increasing in survival, and uh, probably significantly increasing in survival, and then uh, the natural steelhead are, are slightly in survival from 98 to 2017. So that's good. So some of those management actions they're doing down the dam to help kind of give these fish a better chance, it seems like they're working. So the last thing I want to talk about today is, so we put all these fish in the system and all these fish migrate out of the headwaters of the Amnaha, go down to the ocean, and then they come back as adults. So we want to say, okay, how many of our Amnaha fish are actually moving it back as adults? So we actually estimate that with the data that we collect um, from our trap, and then all the detections at the pit tags that we get as fish move out of the system, and then as adults come back up the system. So adult returns um, is important uh, because uh, we need adults to come back to the natal tributaries to kind of populate. Um, the Amnaha tributaries with, with future generations. Um, but then there's also a big uh, tribal, recreational, and commercial harvest component. Not so much commercial anymore because the numbers are too poor. But uh, there is still tribal and recreational fisheries that happen um, for you know, these Snake River populations and the Amnaha population and everything. So. All right, so looking at Smolt to adult return ratios, so smolts that go out and return as adults. Um, we calculate these from uh, juvenile detections at lower granite. So fish that, that we detect at lower granite and move out as juveniles, spend a couple years out in the ocean, and then those individuals that are successful and make it back to lower granite as adults. And so along the way, these fish, they have predators, um, out in the ocean, they have orcas and, and a variety of other things that want to eat them, and then there's a lot of anthropogenic factors that come along with uh, development along with river corridors and everything, and then also, you know, dams are always a, a, a huge factor in, in getting these fish safely out and then safely back. All right, so remember whenever I was describing how there's kind of three ways that juveniles can go down through a dam, they can be bypassed, they can be barged, they, or, um, sorry, they can be bypassed, they can be transported, 
they sorry, I guess there's four. They can be, they can go over a spillway or they can go through a turbine. So we kind of break these two groups apart. And so we estimate smolt to adult return ratios for all those fish that are bypassed down through the dams. And then so we take that group and then we take the rest of the fish, and so the rest of the fish includes those fish that are transported or go over a spillway or whatever um, the management action for, for those fish is at the, that time of the dam. They're kind of in their own group. And so we call that the run at large fish and then we have the bypass fish. And these dashed lines along this figure at the 2% and 6% mark on each figure is what we estimate the, the return that we need to see that, so we see replacement of the adults in these tributaries. So replacement of spawners. And so, and then it's further broken down into our hatchery fish, our, our pre-smolts, and then our natural chinook smolts. And a couple things to take away from these figures is typically our run at large fish have a bit of a higher return rate than our bypass fish. And then also our pre smolts tend to have a bit of a higher return rate than our than the rest of either the hatchery smolts or the natural smolts. And then another thing that kind of stands out is we've definitely seen a decline in our return rates in the past in the recent years. So that's something to be concerned about. We can look at similar figures for steelhead. Um, and they have some of the similar trends. Again, we still have that 2% to 6%. 6% is not on here, it's off the graph. But kind of that established uh, mark for adults to be able to replace themselves. Um, and what we kind of see here is for the run at large fish, our natural steelhead tend to do a little bit better. Um, for the bypass fish, it's pretty much, you know, there's not that much of a difference between the hatchery fish and the natural fish. But again, we see this negative trend um, in recent years. We're just not getting the adult returns uh, that we would like to see. So, kind of wrap this all up and just kind of summarize things a little bit. Um, juvenile survival, looking pretty good. It's looking pretty good down through the, the hydro system. It's, you know, it's probably, it's not perfect by any means, but we're seeing an increase in survival as these fish move down. Uh, through the system in recent years. Um, however, we're not seeing the adult returns that we want. Um, and one reason for this potentially is uh, kind of the ocean conditions, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard about the Pacific Ocean condition, conditions um, in recent years, and you may have even heard of what they termed the blob. Um, and basically the blob is just this really large area of warmer than average water that's in the Pacific Ocean right now. Um, this figure kind of depicts it. And unfortunately, it's right in the area where our salmon, Pacific salmon, like to go out here and rear and grow to adults and get big. And what this blob is doing is it's changing the food web out in the ocean right now. And so when the salmon are out there, they're the, uh, the prey salmon feed on have really been negatively impacted by this warm water temperature. They're just not seeing the prey abundance they need to uh, have these adults be able to survive and grow large out here. Um, however, um, recently I saw this headline that the Pacific heat wave known as the blob appears to be in retreat. So that's starting to break up out there. The ocean conditions are starting to change a little bit. And so hopefully we're going to see the salmon start to respond because the food web out there for the salmon is starting to respond. And, 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 um, so hopefully things will start to get a little bit better. And so all these data that Brian and I talked about today, they really do, um, these long-term data sets really do help inform us on how to manage this hydro system and make things better for fish. And then also, um, there's a lot of data that we collect that go, kind of gives feedback to the hatchery system as well, and helps us make management decisions there. And ultimately, uh, what we're trying to do is mitigate for all the human impacts that these fish have had to endure over the years. And with that, uh, Brian and I can take any questions. If you could get rid of one dam, which would it be? <laughs> <laughs> so there have been some.
studies done out there recently that um, looking at the, the lower Snake River dams, those four dams I was talking about, that suggests that they would see a big boost in re adult return rates if they were to get rid of those lower four, lower four Snake River dams. So um, like I don't know which one it would be. <laughs> What's that? You'd like to get rid of four of them. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, yeah, hey, you go we, for it, right? Uh, and and the Nez Perce tribe, um, we are supportive of you know doing and everything. Um, but yeah, there are people looking into it. I think there's um, there's a court case going on right now that um, looks at you know some scientists, some fish scientists start to have to come up with okay, how would we even go about removing these dams, and, and what kind of benefit would we see? I don't understand. Do you have a survival rate of uh, returning fish when they first come through the first uh, dam of the fish ladder and the last dam? How many you lose on those eight dams? Right oh, as adults? Yeah. That information is out there. Um, we, I, I could estimate that with the information we have. I haven't yet, but the that group that I was talking about earlier that kind of takes all the, the salmon data throughout the Snake in Columbia, they do make those estimates. So for steelhead, um, about 60% of fish are lost from Bonneville to Lower Granite. Yeah. He's our resident steelhead, uh, adult steelhead guy. So, I didn't get this meal. 60% of, of fish that made it to Bonneville do not make it to Lower Granite. They're Hat lost. Hatchery and native folks. Yeah, they're just lost. Both, both. both. Um, that's, that is more of the natural, but I'm sure the, the hatchery is probably very similar. Or probably worse because of harvest. No. Uh, How do you determine the carrying capacity of smelts in the stream if you have both native fish and hatchery fish competing uh, at that stage? Uh, I would think that. Um, too many hatchery fish would negatively impact the, the native smolts in the river and vice versa. So if, if the goal is to enhance native populations, then why do you release the number of hatchery smolts as you do? So the hatchery fish, um, typically, uh, they're not rearing in the streams. Right. They're released from the, from the acclimation sites and they just move down through the system pretty much. So they're not necessarily up in the headwater tributaries where our na our natural fish are. So they're are. not competing. Not in the tributaries, no. no. No, there could potentially be some competition on down through the hydro system and that kind of thing. I haven't necessarily looked at that. I'm sure somebody has. Um, it's probably in the literature somewhere, but that is a good point. And carrying capacity of the system is something that's very hard and data heavy to estimate. So those pre smolts are they are they spending their extra time? In the reservoir sections of the main stem, or where, where I mean, if there are, if they're migrating early, where are they spending that extra time? So that's, I, Jim, do you know that? If, if there's going to well, be studies, above, and it's above Lower Granite Dam, above so somewhere yeah. between our trap on the Lower Maha and the Lower Granite Dam, they're spending the winter there. So the, they're not detected past Lower Granite Dam. I mean, yeah, they could be spending some time in the reservoir above. Lower Granite seems to be that there is some advantage survival wise though for that. I mean didn't they have a sur higher survival rate of free smolts on their downward migration than the No, they have a lower survival rate. I, th I think Laura he, he means once they get to lower granite they perform uh, better than yeah. the smolt at that same right. point. Yeah. Bearing their flows, is the power authority, Bonneville Power Authority, been receptive to making any engineering changes or operational changes in their dams or yeah, anything yeah. of that nature or any projects underway now to, to improve the fish survival? Yeah, they do. Passage? Yeah, they do a lot, a variety of different things. Um, one of the things, it seems like spills, one of, I shouldn't say it's easy because it's not, it affects a lot of people in a lot of different ways. And, when they spill more, they can't they can generate as much electricity. Um, but also, um, so yes, there are a lot of different things that they try to do to help increase survival down through the system. Um, but spill is kind of one of the major things that they do. But another thing I should mention about spill is they have to be really 
careful spill is kind of a double-edged sword um, because whenever they start spilling too much it creates a lot of gas down below saturated gas in the water and that's that can cause gas bubble trauma in these smolts and that can be a source of mortality so there's like a fine line between how much they spill how much spill is too much and how much spill is not enough so they really struggle with that especially in uh, 2017, I think they struggled with it a lot because we had a really big snowpack here. And so they were spilling a lot just because they had to keep the water moving down through the system because they couldn't hold it back. But then it was creating a lot of gas bubble trauma and everything in these fish. So it's, these issues around salmon are super complex and, and hard to pick apart and, and everything. Yeah, I, I think it's good to put, um, like, this is a great display. I actually <laughs> urge people to read this one right here, which talks about the sockeye weaving Wallawa Lake, clogging up the canals. There were so many, we talked about carrying capacity and so on. And it's good to put this in perspective that every one of these creeks around here was raging full of fish year after year, jumping up waterfalls, massive fish. I've seen, I saw someone as a kid, three foot fish way up Catherine Creek in a little tiny stream. And the, the natives, they, like you said, they thrived on them. And there were billions of them through that, all the way up into Canada, all the way up the snake. And now the snake is a putrid, hot river full of nitrates and fertilizers and herbicides. And it's dammed the whole way. They wanted to plug it up with one last dam in the wild section. And Idaho Power is refusing. Uh, this is a for-profit corporation that claims it's you know friendly to the people and providing power life. They're refusing to put fish ladders on the upper snake dams because they don't want to deal with the fish issue. Just like the dam here, the irrigators don't want to put a fish ladder on the Lao Lake Dam. They want someone else to do it. This place used to be full of fish, and we know what the solution is. It's an easy solution. One is there's been two scientific, comprehensive studies on taking out the low, lower four snake dams. And both of those studies concluded clearly, economically, it's a win-win-win. We lose a little irrigation water, a little bit of electricity, but the amount of fish that would come in would boost commercial fishery and sports fishery. And here we're doing this heroic thing. We're like cardiac arrest on the fish. We're breeding salmon, little salmon, and trying to get them to go down the river, trucking them pretty soon. We're going to be helicoptering out there and feeding them in the ocean. It's absurd what we're doing. I appreciate all your science. It's amazing. But these guys are trying to do this heroic salvation of what was a, which if we just took the dams out, they'd flood back, but we also know we have to keep the cows out of the creeks, and there's, that's something to do, and forestry issues, roads, we know how to solve the problem, we just need the political will, and if we'll all step up and demand our politicians do something about it, we can change it, there's people working all across the U.S. to do this, and we need to be a part of that. Okay, Peter, I hate to cut you off, but it is after one, and you should have been here last week when the dam people talked. Fish passage is part of the equation, and the dam management people are pro fish passage. Okay, think of that. So, forget, forget what you do from a couple of years ago. And pay now, look, what I just said is all true, still. It's all true, still. But dam passage at Wallawa Lake is now on the table. I'll take the dam out and leave it out. Well. <laughs> yeah, why do we laugh about that? That's, why not? That's <laughs> something else. Peter, write an editor, write a letter to the editor. And, I'll do it. <laughs> and explain your point of view. Thank and you, guys. Week, yeah. I appreciate very much the presentation. Again. <laughs> Peter, you were wondering also about the High Mountain Chief Dam. That was only one of three more dams that was to be completed. So, and uh, when we turn the lights on, you guys might want to look at this because their fish trap on the lower Imnaha.